Shelby Switzer from uh, US Digital Service. Uh, she's a software engineer um, with um, the background in API design and strategy. And she's going to talk about how to build a healthcare API from scratch, complete with interactive documentation and tests. I saw she'll be in backstage, so she should be coming soon. In the meantime, let me pull your attention to the questions in the polls, if you want to answer them. And you can always check out uh, the other stages, the workshop roundtables, and the partner's village, but only after Shelby's presentation. Hey, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Here she is. Hello. Hello. Let's see your screen with all the windows that you were talking about. <laughs> all right. Um, let's see. I seem to have a delay, by the way. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm not hearing you loud and clear. But if you can hear me, I'll go ahead and share my screen. I can hear you well, and it seems to be in sync with uh, the way your lip is moving. So on our end, this seems OK. Great. OK. I wait till you can share your screen, and then I go away from the stage. OK. OK, can you see my slides? Yes. If you could hide the uh, bar about Hopin on the bottom, click on hide. Yeah. Great. We're great. OK, go ahead. Cool. OK, all right. So I'm ready to get started. Um, so thanks for joining me with my talk. This is going to be somewhat interactive. Um, hopefully, you can follow along. I have cut the time from 30 minutes to 20 minutes. So it will be really fast, and I've had to kind of cut some of the live coding pieces. So um, hopefully you can still follow along. I have also posted all of my code and everything on GitHub, and I'll share that link afterwards and in case you want to check anything out after the talk. So a little bit about me. Um, I uh, Here's my Twitter information and my GitHub information. Um, notably, I have two GitHubs, one for my government work, one for my personal open source work. Um, I've been at the US Digital Service for um, a little over a year now. Uh, before this, I was working in healthcare technology. I'm working a lot in the civic tech, civic tech space as well with Code for America brigades and other efforts like that. Um, I've been doing APIs since I got into software almost 10 years ago. Um, and I have a civic tech blog um, that I haven't posted on at all during the pandemic because I've been super busy on um, you know government work and response and things like that. Um, but check it out. And hopefully, I'll get back to it once things kind of calm down in the world. Um, a little bit about the digital service before I continue. Uh, the US Digital Service is a government agency. Uh, we are um, under, we basically help other agencies. So we are feds ourselves, we are term limited. So we can only be in office for, or in our positions for two to four years at max. Um, and the point of this is to get private sector technologists with fresh, modern best practices expertise from the private sector coming into government to do a tour of service for a short amount of time um, to kind of get in, bring in our best practices, shake things up, um, help the great public service, um, public servants out there already doing great work, help them with our expertise, and then leave again um, to go back into the private sector, to go keep getting fresh experience um, so that we don't get too used to um, government life. And uh, we're constantly bringing in people with um, the latest knowledge and tools and best practices. Um, I've mostly been working at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and now most recently the CDC, um, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, and doing healthcare technology and data infrastructure work, which is how I, I came here today to kind of share some of the things that we've been doing. What I'm going to talk about, I am going to go over uh, hopefully what's in this for you and why you're here, some, some of the things we're going to learn today. Um, I'm also going to do a brief introduction to the concepts because some of these things might be new to different folks in the audience. And then we're just going to go dive right into the demo. I'm going to talk about our dependencies and the steps, and then we're going to just do it. 
Um, I'm also then going to give some tips for how to make this sort of thing work for you. And also some ideas from where to go from here for the industry. Um, and then finally, there's going to be a list of resources at the end. So what's in this for you? Um, hopefully today you're going to learn about some new open source tools. You're also going to get hands on with Fire. We're going to talk about what Fire is, as well as the open API specification. Um, I'm sure you've already seen a bunch of great talks today on the open API specification and other uh, machine readable API definition formats. So, um, you know, we're going to really dive in and make that practical today. Um, and we're also going to practice this design first API development paradigm where we design the API we mock it, we iterate, um, and then we develop and test. So um, the concepts. A couple of API concepts I want to make sure we're all grounded in. So first, the API product lifecycle. This is something um, that I talk about all the time whenever I talk about APIs. Um, and I think it's really important to keep in mind that this is the sort of life cycle that we are going on. And this is the bedrock of my API practice, um, starting with design, You know, thinking about our users and our problems. Um, building from a design rather than designing from a build, um, and then managing our API once it's built, um, then to on to engagement, discovery, and promotion, making sure that you're getting the word about your API out there and getting the word about your API back into your organization to learn uh, from user feedback, and then using that to incorporate back into the design, and then continuing this life cycle. The second concept about APIs I want to make sure we're all on the same page about is that open API specification. So some of you may know this still as Swagger, um, still a common name in the industry for this, um, but it is now open API specification. Um, it's got three versions now, um, not just two. And this is probably, you know, this is the canonical API definition format that the industry has kind of converged around. There are other formats that you can use um, that I also like using, like API Blueprint or RAML. Um, you know, I really like API Blueprint, but we're not going to use that today. Um, and the key thing to think about with your definition is that this is the API contract. Um, and I believe, and I'm going to demonstrate today, how you can use this as the backbone for your API product lifecycle. Next, some healthcare concepts. Um, so I'm sure probably a lot of people in this audience are new to the healthcare space. Um, and because, and even if you've been in it for a while, like I have, uh, it's still so much to wrap your head around. So I wanna make sure we are talking, we're using the same words. Um, so first, when we talk about APIs in healthcare, we're kind of talking about a lot of different things. We're not just talking about REST APIs or even SOAP APIs. Um, typically, the landscape is full of customization over standardization. Um, there's customization not only in API design, but also in you know, the business of healthcare, um, the workflow of specific users, such as your nurses, your practitioners. Um, you know, there's so much customization that really makes standardization quite hard and not something that we've been able to be very successful with. Um, as part of this customization, there are so many on-prem legacy systems. Um, most hospital systems in the US at least, and probably in other countries, are um, you know, these on-prem things that have been there for decades. Um, and we're only slowly starting to move to the cloud. Um, and there's also this hugely variable tech. But recently, you know, over the past 20 years, we've been gradually embarking on this journey towards interoperability, which is something I spoke in more depth about at a previous API Days conference in June. So check out that talk if you want to learn more about that journey. Um, but a key thing to note is that policy and government are major drivers of interoperability, which has been something that I've been doing a lot in my time here at US Digital Service. So to visualize how complicated APIs are in healthcare, um, here's just a really rough diagram of just even a small segment of what the landscape looks like. So we have the patient at the top. We've got all these different providers who might be individual providers with their own clinics, might be big health systems, might be even larger health systems. You have academia in here using data um, and building applications. You've got various versions of standards, um, such as HL7, uh, version 2.3, 2.5, version 3. Um, and everybody is doing these standards differently, um, even though they're called standards. Um, and then we're starting to move towards this thing called FHIR, uh, which is represented here as well. Um, and because of the pure uh, variety in the ecosystem, we're seeing a lot of things like health information exchanges or health information networks, which is this HIE and HIN pop up, as well as um, companies that do interface engines. So these are companies that are 
you know, promising more standardized APIs or quicker paths to integration in lieu of good APIs. Um, and then finally, also please note that there is still a lot of CSV happening. Um, there's a lot of web portals, lots of paper and lots of facts uh, that are still weighing down our integration ecosystem. So as we've been on this journey towards interoperability, um, there's some other thing, there's, there's been attempts to kind of uh, make it clear what this means. Um, and HIMS, uh, which is a major healthcare interoperability organization, information management organization, um, has put forth these four levels of interoperability. There's foundational. So these are like your HTTP connection, your VPN, they're structural. So um, you know, your JSON or your XML, uh, they're semantic. So making sure that when you do have a field in the data that you're talking about the same things and there's some standardization around these semantics, um, as well as organizational, which is around your governance, um, your policy compliance um, and things like that. So as we've been trying to get towards these levels of interoperability, um, the latest greatest thing is FHIR. Uh, this stands for Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources. Um, it's a great word, resources, um, you know, indicates really that this is a REST aspiring framework to think about healthcare APIs. It's supposed to be a modern replacement of that HL7 standard that I discussed earlier. It's still pretty early in adoption. So, you know, there are FHIR API APIs out there. Um, and notably, some of the early implementers of FHIR APIs are government, such as the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, and they're doing a really great job at um, making implementations match policy and driving the industry forward. Um, a few more things that I think are really important to note about FHIR, especially in the API community. Um, FHIR is, you know, REST aspiring. It's designed for machines. So it's very self-descriptive, um, self-discoverable. Um, it does a lot of things like linking out to profiles and schemas that explain the semantics. Um, so really REST concepts um, that are implemented in great detail and depth. Um, there are, it's not really meant to work with open API or other API definitions um, because you're, you're supposed to have these things called profiles and capability statements that pretty much act as that API definition or API contract. Um, and then there's this thing called an implementation guide, which you might have heard of referred to just as an IG, which is the standard documentation for Fire APIs. Um, so with these things kind of already built in and there's some culture around them that's really kind of coming from this previous culture around HL7, you know, if I wasn't really designed in concert with um, other API things outside of the healthcare industry like open API. And we're going to run into some of those issues and some of those incompatibilities during this talk. So let's go. All right. So I've been going for about eight minutes so far. So let's see if we can actually build something in 10 minutes and then we can get to questions. Um, first, to run through the dependencies, um, you know, in general, what you're going to need for doing this, you're going to need a machine readable API definition. We're using open API. You're going to need a server generator. We're going to use an open source project called open API enforcer middleware, which is linked um, in my resources page. We're going to need a documentation generator. We're going to use Redoc. Um, and we're going to need a testing library, and we're going to use open API chai validators. So notably, the sub dependencies here are Node.js and an internet browser. And what we're going to do is we're going to start with our user and problem. We're going to create our open API definition. We're going to generate human friendly documentation that we then use for iteration. Then we're going to generate our mock server, which we also use for iteration. And then finally, we're going to build functionality on top of the server so it can become a real API, and then we're going to test it. So starting with the user and the problem, this is so important because uh, we can't really have a useful API if we don't have a problem and a user and, um, and understand what they're trying to do. So here's an example of a user and a problem, um, something that we encounter sometimes. Um, you know, We have a doctor, they have their own practice. And let's say as this doctor, I'd like to manage a list of patients who are eligible for immunizations. This might sound vaguely familiar and relevant for our world right now. Um, and let's say I have several partners or other clinics in public health, and we want to work on the same list to divide and conquer outreach to eligible folks in our community and track who's received immunizations. Um, so pretty simple use case, kind of like a CRM. Um, so hopefully it's approachable for most of the folks in the audience. Um, so now that we understand our problem and our user, let's get started with our API. Um, so first, let's 
figure out what fire models we're going to use so that we can kick this off in an interoperable way using some of the latest, greatest healthcare technologies. Um, and let's try to keep this as simple as possible. Um, and then we can also think about other implementation design questions like JSON, um, or do we need to have XML available for our users? Um, uh, just a, a hint, we're only going to do JSON, um, but it's a question you should be asking. Um, and let's take a look at what that fire specification looks like. Oops, sorry. Um, <laughs> so this is the HL7 fire core implementation guide for the US. Um, you can read all about it. It's wonderful. I've linked to it in the deck. And you can see there's lots of different models that might be applicable for us and probably many more that are not really applicable for our use case. Uh, so there's things like medication, there is an immunization model, there's location, which may, we may want to use, uh, there's organization, there's patient, and um, there's so many different models, um, and we don't need all of them. Uh, for, so if we were going to look at the JSON open API definition representation of all the core capabilities, um, it's really massive. Uh, look at all these paths that we'd have to document. Uh, this JSON file in its raw form is like a million lines. It's ridiculous. And we don't need all that. Um, it's actually impossible to work with. So we're just going to take what we need. And we're going to start simple um, and just talk about our patient model um, and the basic kind of CRUD actions around a patient. So what I've done um, is I've just pulled out um, our openapi.json file, um, and I've created you know, just this patient information. We have you know, a summary description. We've got our get endpoint to get all the patients. We can create a patient, um, et cetera. So um, this can also be done in YAML instead of JSON, which is a bit more human friendly. Um, but this is essentially what an open API doc looks like. So we're just starting with patient. And, um, and let's see you know, if that's going to be enough. But in order to get to figuring out if this is enough, we have to start getting some user feedback. Um, we have to start also figuring out you know, the implementation aspect. So we need to share this information with the dev team so they can use it, um, and then the client dev team um, to make sure that it's usable for them. So we do that with human-friendly documentation. And we can do this pretty much immediately as soon as we have an open API doc. Um, there are lots of free SaaS options out there. There's lots of options that you can also integrate into your code and continuous integration and continuous delivery pipeline. Uh, we're just going to go with Redoc for now um, because it's open source um, and because it has a free website option that you can plug any sort of open API file into to then generate that documentation quickly. Um, and one of the reasons I like Redoc as well is because it is open source. And then if I wanted to take this further and publish this on my website as my documentation, I can do that easily incorporating it into my software development lifecycle. Um, so as you can see in the, in the Redoc um, documentation, I've got you know, examples of what my you know, content type is. It's fire JSON. I've got examples of my response. Um, I can even dive into the structure in a bit better of a way. So some of the things about Fire, as I mentioned, you know, it's really meant to be machine readable. Um, so it can get pretty complex with nested structures. The patient resource, as I've defined it, is pretty pretty simple as far as they go. Um, but you know, even with identifier for patient, you know, this is actually an array for all your business identifiers. So you have an ID for your identifier. You have your use. Um, as well as your value for your identifiers. So this might be your social security number, your electronic health record identifier. Um, and there's also things like name, which can also be kind of complicated. So you might have many names and you have to have all this information about any given name within your name set. Um, so this is just much easier to read and give feedback on um, when it's in a human friendly documentation. This would have been really hard to understand if I just read the JSON. Um, so moving right along, we have about five minutes left. Um, so I've got my human friendly documentation. It was super fast and free. Um, and now let's generate our mock server. So um, I have used, I'm using the open API enforcer, uh, which is a great little open source library that you can get on GitHub. Um, and what I like about it is that it's extensible. So um, basically what open API enforcer will do is it will generate this mock server for me. It will auto populate the responses with fake values if I have not provided examples, but I can also provide examples in my open API definition so that they're, they're better. Um, and then I can also then build on this functionality when I'm ready to move past my mocks. So um, 
I've got my terminal up. If I just hit npm start, um, hopefully this will work. Um, it did, okay. So let's also take a look at what I just started. Um, so I all I have to do is have an index.js file. You know, I've got my uh, packages, et cetera, defined my package JSON file. Um, but really I'm just kicking off an express server with cores, um, setting my cores origin in case I need that. Um, and then there's just some boilerplate code that you can just copy from their tutorial. And now that I have this mock server up, I can actually just go to my server um, and I can check out a patient. And as you can see, I so I didn't do any sort of examples in my open API definition um, and open API enforcer has just provided a bunch of text kind of fake information and it also does it dynamically. So if I do it again, I started out, my first request was just one in my array of patients. Um, but if I had made another request, it went to two patients in my array. So it's a bit more, it's a bit better and more interesting to then iterate my development on than just a static mock server, uh, which, you know, some people like really chafe against. Um, so that's pretty cool. So next, we want to build functionality. So say this patient CRM kind of functionality just with patients is good enough. We don't need to go add like the immunization model yet. Maybe we'll get there eventually. Um, but let's say, let's just go ahead and build from here. Let's add our database functionality and everything. Um, and this is just involves a few simple steps. So what I'm gonna do is exit out of my server. Um, I have all of my code saved in different branches so I can share it really easily. Um, I'm going to show you an example of what a controller could look like. So, um, so pretty much now in my index.json file, I am just setting up a Postgres connection as my data store. Um, and I am passing things on to my controllers. So I've developed a patient.js controller. Um, so, you know, when you do a post request, we're going to actually insert into patients, um, given all the information that's in the request. Um, and this information is um, identified in our open API spec. So if I take a look at our open API JSON file, um, the only thing I have to do is open API enforcer is add some um, new properties and my X controller. So saying, you know, instead of using my mock controller, let's use my X control, let's use my actual controller patients, which will then route the request to the patient JavaScript that I um, just demonstrated. So that's pretty cool. It makes building on top of my mocks super, super easy. Um, and once I've done that, now let's say I've got all my functionality built out and I just wanna test things. So um, with testing, there's a bunch of open source libraries out there. You can do kind of live testing with Postman or PAW. Uh, there's other things like RunScope and uh, SmartBear and uh, all these different companies that provide great testing software. Um, and there's also these open source libraries that you can integrate into your CI CD. So what I've done for my little Node.js Express application is I've just used some open API chai validators. So let's see what those look like. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and npm install um, so that we're ready to run the test. Um, and all I've had to do is create a patients.js test file um, and with my validator, I can just define my test that my patient endpoint should satisfy my open API spec, which will look to make sure that my response coming from my controller matches my open API definition, um, which is cool. So if I just run npm test now, um, I can see that my test is passed. So super great and wonderful. Um, and again, all of this code is available online so you can see how it all works and you can try to replicate it yourself. So some tips, so I'm at the 20 minute mark, so I'm gonna run through the tips really quickly. So hopefully there's time for Q&A. Um, and tips is that that open API definition that I showed at the beginning, it's huge. It has lots of numerous web references to JSON schemas that live on the, the web. Um, so it's really slow. Um, it slows down your tooling a lot. So I would probably never actually use that full spec unless I did some serious modifications to it. Um, to make it faster and maybe implement some caching of different like sub resources within it, um, which I know some people at CMS have done, for example, when they have an extensive fire fire API, they then do some caching um, and some like different module loading for their open API spec because it's just so massive. 
Um, if JavaScript's not your thing, there are other languages with other tooling support. There's a huge open source ecosystem out there. Please check it out. I've got some links to some websites um, in my resources section. And I just want to say you can get really far with just a mock. Like you don't really need to build functionality at all until you've had your mock, you've done user testing, your client side have then done some of their own user testing with the mock data you're providing, and then you can start building it out. And I think that's a much more efficient development uh, uh, product development lifecycle. Um, and finally, you can also add examples to your definition so you have a more realistic mock than what you saw me demonstrate today. Um, there are some things that I really hope that we can do as an industry to improve this process. So one, uh, build more Fire APIs. We've got to do that uh, to make the tooling better and to really advance the spec and make the ecosystem more interoperable and remove all that spaghetti that I showed earlier. Um, and second, we need to add to the open source tooling ecosystem that supports Fire and Open API um, and really thinking about how to make those live together. Um, you know, we have to work towards greater harmony between Fire and industry agnostic API standards, tools, and best practices, because right now it is a big pain, which is one of the reasons I created this presentation to try to help people navigate that if they want to do both Fire and Open API. Um, but there's a lot more work to be done. So hopefully we'll get there. Um, and there's some resources. Again, all this post is posted on GitHub. So if you just go to Switzer SC USDS slash healthcare API, I'll also tweet about this later and post it in chat. Um, that's where you can find all this information. And if you're interested in any of this or interested in working on really impactful stuff and you're based in the US, um, please consider applying um, or checking out your own country's digital service organization because many countries now have great digital services as part of government. So that's it. Thanks, y'all. Thank you, Shelby. Um, if somebody has questions, uh, it's in the chat where you can post uh, them. Um, I have to admit that I'm completely blown away. <laughs> but, uh, this is not what I do in every day. Uh, I'm mostly uh, working with uh, the written uh, word as a newsletter and uh, talking with people about their processes. So um, I cannot ask you a technical question, but uh, could you um, go back to your resources slide? Uh, because there were several things people may want to write down. And um, so you say um, your presentation was to help navigating this whole space of novelty. Is there uh, other um, high level navigation materials people would need to be able to explain this to somebody else? Um, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, I would say that specifically for thinking about how to do healthcare APIs and integrations in a more modern way with the great tools like Open API and other things that are out there, um, I would say there's not a whole lot. Um, you know, these these resources here will kind of get you started on the pieces of each one individually, but for really starting to bridge that, um, you know, this talk. Um, I've given a previous talk that I think was recorded about health, the journey to healthcare interoperability. Um, I, that's also a good introduction into like the pure mire of healthcare tech nastiness um, and how it's getting better. But otherwise, I would say take a look at some of the work that the FIRE community is doing because they are slowly making their way towards um, more overlap with the API industry. Um, you can, there's a Zulip chat, which is just like a web browser chat that you can look at for fire and just start to see some of the things going on. There's some working groups. And then I would also say, check out the great work that's coming out of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services in the US um, and take a look at what's coming out of the Department of Veterans Affairs because both of those agencies are really working to implement good APIs with fire. And they're doing things like having both open API tooling and interactive documentation and stuff alongside um, the fire and interoperability aspect. Mm -hmm. uh, Zoltan Simon is asking uh, if you have tips how to choose the right fire subset. Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? If you have any tips to choose the right uh, fire subset. Oh, right. Um, yeah, so I think it really just depends on um, your use case and kind of going back to starting with your user and problem statement. The, I mean, the fire spec, again, is so large. And even within each model, there's like so many things you probably don't need. 
Um, so I would just, you know, keep it as simple as possible and keep it as small as possible and then add things as you, as you discover that you need them. Because it's always easier to add things than to take things away or to deal with things that you added prematurely. Um, another thing I would say is if you're in the US and you're doing FIRE or doing healthcare data exchange at all, um, check out the new US CDI, um, which is the United States core definition interface. I can't remember what it stands for. Um, but the US CDI is basically the US's attempt to, the federal government's attempt to say, these are the absolute core fields you need for healthcare data exchange. So like, you know, your patient name, your patient birth date, you know, like really just the heart, like the really core stuff you need. And then everything else is optional. Um, so I would check that out as a good place to start in terms of starting with your, your core elements and then building out from there. Thank you, Shelby. Uh, would you still put the, your availability, your, your connection uh, points into the chat, uh, those that are public? Um, and I have to say that our amazing uh, whole day track now is concluded. So um, this was the API documentation and developer experience stage uh, for uh, API Days Paris for 2020. Uh, and I would like to thank all of our speakers and everybody who was working uh, in the backstage uh, for uh, the tremendous amount of effort and energy and time that they have put into this. I hope everybody who was listening um, is going away with valuable insights and applicable tips and tricks. Um, in the usual style, uh, every presentation that um, was recorded will be available. Um, I'm unclear at this point about uh, written recaps, um, if we are doing that. Um, but the video recordings will definitely will be available, and I assume also the slide decks. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of it. Uh, after uh, the tracks today, there is going to be a fireside chat with the Postman founders. And I've seen some party party in the program after that. 